Hi, everyone, and good afternoon. We're going to give people a few minutes. A lot of you may be a little bit surprised by this early morning. Usually, Lizzie, I do these chats in the evening. Oh, okay, <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> So if you're watching out there, as some of you already know, I am the editor of Raritan Neighbors, New Jersey. That's my local paper. And for another half of you, you probably see me all the time on LinkedIn doing careers with Donella. But today, this was just such a, a great, oh, sorry, we have a little echo. But today, I thought this was amazing to talk to Lizzie Post, who I'm going to introduce in a minute. It's the holidays. You need tips. How do you handle your family? How do you handle those work parties? So I said, you know what? Why don't we do a double live stream? Put them together. <laughs> Put them together. <laughs> <laughs> so with Lizzie Post. So everyone, I want to formally introduce Lizzie Post. And Lizzie, I'm going to talk a little bit about you. Lizzie Post and Daniel Post Senning. Daniel, shout out if you're out there. I just tried to connect with him on LinkedIn. <laughs> they are the great, great grandchildren of Emily Post and the co-presidents of the Emily Post Institute. And they are providing a full, a fully, excuse me, a fully updated and relatable guide. So if you remember Emily Post, which we all do, you're now listening to the next generation who are bringing us this much needed information, which we're going to go into, Lizzie. I hope we don't take too much of your time today. If you've got all the afternoon. I'll stay as long as you need me. <laughs> And with, this is really great because what I love how you describe the book. This is a stylish and essential reference, provides thoughtful guidance on how to do it well, professional communication, etiquette, and this is rooted in a foundation of consideration, respect, and honesty. And this edition continues the post family legacy of upholding traditions while moving forward with the times, which we're going to talk a lot about that today. Okay. <laughs> and shout out to Denise Dudley. Uh, she's from SkillPath. She says hi. She's on the call. Jermaine Stanley, a lot of people. Hi. So Lizzie, before we begin first, a little bit background, because I do have people overseas who join at night. Okay. Tell us a little bit background about Emily Post. So Emily Post has been America's go-to source for etiquette advice for the past century. We are really proud that ever since Emily launched her book uh, that was wonderfully just titled Etiquette and then became Emily Post's Etiquette uh, in 1922, that we've been able to carry that tradition on. Emily herself stewarded the tradition from 1922 to 1960 when she passed away. And then my grandmother and my grandfather, uh, her only grandchild, they took it over in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, try shepherding etiquette during those culture revolutions. Um, my Aunt Peggy came on board in the 1990s. And then my father, my Aunt Cindy, myself, my sister, my mother, and my cousin Dan all came on board um, in the in the 2000s. And then um, over time, some family members decided to retire. And so uh, Dan and I are now running the company and we have an entire um, training uh, business, training and services. Uh, we keep the books alive in the tradition of Emily, always looking forward to future generations so that the etiquette is current and that we're not just stuck in the 1920s. <laughs> and then we also have a really robust podcast that we serve up weekly. We never take vacations and we never do reruns. Um, and that's a Q&A show. So you can write into us with your etiquette questions and hear the answers. But a lot going on at the Institute. We just launched, launched excuse me, a Substack newsletter, which we're really, really excited about, um, gives us a chance to build more of a community where we're actually going to get to hear more from our audiences and not just in that social media space, but really in a dedicated space for people who want to come around and talk about etiquette. Thank you. And I think that's really great because I think it's really timely because some mm -hmm. people think Etiquette can be dated. I, yeah. you know, have this silverware set. I have an etiquette book. I love this book. So this is a centennial edition. Talk a little bit about what it covers from the modern perspective. So what I love about this book is it was because we were switching publishers, it was actually a chance to rewrite the book from scratch. And that was something we needed to do. So when we sat down and looked at the, well, we actually couldn't look at the 19th edition, but when we were, when we were thinking about rewriting this book, we said, okay, what 
what do we want to put in it? Because we know we want to make this book more accessible to people. We want the price point to not be $50. We'd like it more in that $30 range. Mm -hmm. And we really want to think about what people actually want to come to us for. Our previous 19th edition had things like hiking etiquette and tennis club etiquette in it. And it just seemed like, you know, people are probably gonna Google that kind of stuff, you know what I mean? Right. So we said, what do people think of when they think of Emily Post etiquette? And we've been able to put all of these wonderful tips into the book from greetings and introductions to table manners, everyday communications. This is one place where um, advice changes frequently. Our modern technology has us engaging in so many ways. Right. Emily wrote about, you know, letter writing and maybe phone calls in the 1920s. Phones still weren't in every household and uh, in-person conversations. We've got letter writing, in-person conversations, text messages, video calls, regular yes. phone calls, email, you know, faxes still exist. I mean, there's so many ways that we can communicate with one another, really figuring out what are the fundamentals, what are the ways to communicate well and build better relationships. So um, there's so much, Danella. You're going to have to like <laughs> cut me off, interrupt me, get in here anytime you want. <laughs> okay, um, but we've been talking about things like I was really excited to put pronouns into the introduction section. Of and that's interesting. Yeah, I want to talk about that because mm -hmm. how do you deal? How do you even figure that out? Because it's so challenging. Well, I feel like. It, it can be challenging because I think we're all kind of being, um, I don't want to say we're all being introduced because uh, folks who fall outside of binary gender standards have been around for generations and generations, thousands of years, and yet they haven't gotten the recognition. Um, we've all for years just assumed that by looking at someone, you could probably tell their gender. And these are assumptions that from an etiquette standpoint, we really don't want to be making. So we try to mm -hmm. encourage people to ask if you're unsure. That way right. you can get the answer rather than make the assumption and then have to apologize if you're wrong. And, and I have to, you know, in a work setting, or even if you're at the family holidays, you know, you have someone who might be a little older who doesn't understand that. How do you deal with those situations? I think people are trying to figure out how to navigate. What's the best way where we're not having to blow up at Thanksgiving this, <laughs> this Thursday? Totally. I think we want to be understanding of the fact that um, folks, especially folks in our lives who are senior, uh, might have a harder time. They've had more years where that assumption of gender is something that they're used to being able to lean on. So we do want to be forgiving. We do want to be tolerant. But at the same time, we can still stand up for ourselves. We can still let uh, grandma or grandpa or, or our grandparent know um, that, you know, we use the, the pronouns they. Oh, grandma, you know, my friend or myself, you know, mm -hmm. I really do use that pronoun they. And and I'd be so excited if you if you use it when introducing me or when talking about me. And I have a question. So from a work standpoint, a lot of people are now going to start to go into the holiday parties. I'm kind of going to go farther. Got it. Um, <laughs> so what are some things that maybe um, that are still true today as far as etiquette that they should remember now when they're going to a work party? Because I think that's a big indication. You kind of see when people are not going to get necessarily promoted. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the whole lampshade on the head. <laughs> well, I know that's how you are at a dinner party or cocktails. And, exactly. you know, like I was surprised. I remember when I was working, um, I was surprised a lot of the managers used to look at how people would pick up the silverware. Oh. And I was like, wow, yeah. at dinner parties. And they're like, well, how can we send you out for a client? If mm -hmm. even during our sales conference, you don't know your, your forks and your knives and the left. And all. I'm so interesting glad that you brought this up because it, it gets at an interesting dichotomy in etiquette. And that's that we both really don't want to judge others. Right. right. If we're judging then we're probably missing out on the great person that we're interacting with. But at the same time, things like holding your silverware awkwardly, the, the classic that we talk about is that fist grip, yes. which actually doesn't give you a lot of dexterity with your fork. And I have watched a child in some of our children's classes launch a piece of chicken across the table and into his sister's lap because he was using that, that grip and didn't have the dexterity he needed. So there's, 
there's a practical reason for using your utensils uh, in certain ways. And often it comes from a place of, of not creating distraction. If someone's watching me cut like this and they're so focused on that grip, and they're missing out on the great business conversation, the ideas, the selling, the pitch point. Those things become a distraction, or sorry, the those things are the things we want to get across. And if our table manners are a distraction to that, that's a real problem. Um, it means we're not being as effective in our business skills as we could be. So these are things to both watch out for and work mm -hmm. on from a self-respect or a self-reflective place. Right. But they're things that we also also really on the flip side of the coin, try to get people not to judge others by because you're going to miss out if you're focused too much on the etiquette and the nitty gritty. So it's this strange balance that has to happen. Um, right. It's a really good point to recognize that people in business, they're going to notice things. They might not promote you because of them. We never want etiquette to be used as a weapon. We mm -hmm. never want it yeah. to be used as a secret code that only the people in the know know. Um, right. it's, it's useless when it's like that. But when we're using it for self-reflection, when we're saying, I want to be polished so that people are focused on my words, that's when we're most effective with etiquette. That's really great. Um, how do you, because um, we get this question a lot with people, dealing with people of different cultures. Yeah. Uh, and maybe, is there something, can you talk a little bit about that and, uh, you know, what you, how do you help people with that or talk about a little, a tip or something from the book? Because that's a big thing. It's just so different. I remember when I worked in, Amsterdam and it was a totally <laughs> different. I was like, whoa. And they're like, why are you doing that? Why are you doing that? And You're like, I'm so American. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, like uh, the crisscross with the silverware. I know I keep bringing oh, that up. It is a totally different style. So we but, own yeah. at Emily Post, we try to kind of um stay in our lane. <laughs> we yeah. make sure that that we're really clear that we're talking about American Western etiquette culture um okay. as best we can. And Whenever we're talking about visiting a culture that's different from our own, we say, this is where the internet is your best friend. Do some research, some really classic places to or, or topics to look up when you're thinking about doing business with someone from another culture are things like how do we handle greetings and introductions so that we're honoring people in ways that they feel comfortable with right. um, and that we're using their correct names, pronouns, titles, designations things like that. Uh, we want to make sure that we're paying attention to table manners. You mentioned the crisscross yeah. of the silverware in Amsterdam. Yeah. And so just really paying attention, recognizing that um, you might come from a culture where eating with your hands is actually really standard. Um, right. We have that as a mixed standard here in the United States. You know, I eat my fried chicken with, um, with my hands quite often, but I'm using a fork and knife if it's saucy barbecue chicken, you know? Right. And so there, there's different ways that we might incorporate that. And we really want to pay attention to our table manners when we're going to dine with folks from another culture and we're in their culture. When we're in our own, it's okay for us to use our manners. Um, but tipping and gift giving are two other really big practices that you want to look up when you're visiting a country, a country other than your own. Right. Um, so those four are kind of the four biggies. Um, and then, of course, we always say it's really wonderful to discover what the magic words in that language, in a different language would be so that you can utilize those very simple um, thank you, you're welcome, excuse me, please. Um, right. Oh my gosh, I'm missing one. I'm sorry. That's another one. Um, but make you sure you know all of them, Lizzie. Yeah, exactly. I know, right? <laughs> this is the test. Like that. <laughs> um, so really important to look at those things when we're thinking about visiting another culture. That's great. And I'm look, I'm just highlighting the book here for people to see. Thank so you. you're talking about, yeah, it's great. And, and I love that you mentioned that it was affordable for people because I know people think, oh, etiquette, they think it's this, you know, one percenter thing. And it's yes. not like we all need to have it. And, mm -hmm. you know, we talk about that. So you talk about table manners and gift 
giving? Are there any like little um, things to mention for people, uh, gift giving, whether it's personal or business? Because that's a big thing. How do you not offend anyone nowadays? Right. It's a big <laughs> thing. You think it's a great gift. And next thing you know. <laughs> I know, right? Gift giving when it comes to business, two of the big pointers that we go after are that you don't typically gift up the ladder. So an employee doesn't often yeah. gift their boss. Um, the exception that we like to talk about and that me being a Sex in the City fan loves to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> that moment. Well, so you know the the yeah. movie version where right. oh, um, Carrie gets gets Jennifer Hudson as her assistant, right? Right. That is actually an excellent, excellent example of gifting between two people who one one is an assistant and one is a boss, mm -hmm. and they have such a close relationship. And the gifts they chose to give each other were really appropriate based on those relationships. Oh, okay. the, the reason why you wouldn't want to gift up the ladder typically is at a bigger organization is that you don't want it to look like you're trying to buy your boss's favor. Mm -hmm. So let's say you have a really awesome boss that you right. and your team are so appreciative of. Get the group together. Get the team together. Do it as a group okay. effort. That way it doesn't look like you're trying to forward yourself, right. but we're all showing our appreciation. Oh, and that's a lot more tasteful because I do think of that. Like there are some people you want to just, you know, there are some, believe it or not, everyone out there that are great yeah. bosses. <laughs> there are. <laughs> there was like, so that's a really good tip. Uh, let's see. Let's go through just a minute. Um, yeah. Let's see how to a good host and a good guest from handling invitations because I'm I'm kind of on the fence about electronic okay. invitations, but it saves time. They're very pretty. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know if you have some insights on that. When do you want to give per? You know, it just makes a difference. And when you get a hard copy invitation, you're like, whoa. You feel like you get more time and an evite, you're like, okay, and then I can see everyone on the list. And if I really oh, want to go, I know. <laughs> if I really want to go, because I don't like those people on the list. <laughs> So e Pros and cons. <laughs> exactly like evites and other digital invitations are they're they're a blessing and a curse, right? On the yeah. one hand, they are so convenient. Often you get more RSVPs in the moment when you send it out, when someone first opens it. So that's really, really great because most of us hosts, when we're tracking down RSVPs, it's driving us nuts. Right. And so what I really love about the digital invitation is that so so many of us nowadays are at our computers, on our phones, connected to our email. It simply works. It's easy. It's functional. It's great. However, mm -hmm. It's less personal. We are not a fan at Emily Post of the visible guest lists. I think that we all, we we still stick tried and true to the etiquette advice that if a host invites you to something, you should be saying yes based on the invitation, not based on the guest list. There are some safety concerns that some people yeah. may have in their lives. I really want to point that out. If that's an issue for you, call up your host, talk with them about it. That's a that's kind of a one-off thing that, that is important and should be considered. But that's something you and your host can have a discussion about rather than just claiming we should all just show guest lists all the time. Right. And so- I think that's really important when you're thinking about a digital invitation like you. I appreciate that that um, physical invitation that comes to my house. When I receive that, I seem to pay a bit more attention to it. I can get a mm -hmm. sense from the feel of the paper, the style of the invitation, how formal the event is if they haven't put any attire guide information on it. Right. So. I think we don't want to kill off the, the physical invitation. And at the same time, we really want to be careful about how we use digital invitations. That's great. That's a good point, too. And I love here how you say managing hard times from what to say and what not to say. Yeah. Because I know coming coming from work, sometimes people don't realize, and there's so many, so many things about microaggressions, macroaggressions. Yeah. You know, and what do you say if you know someone's passed away or, you know, and I, I bring this to work or someone's going away because they have an illness. I guess your book really talks a lot about that in depth from a modern perspective. Thank you. I'm glad to hear that. This was a chapter I was really proud of that we expanded. Um, it's the first time our book really talks about um, grieving a lost pregnancy um, oh, wow. and, That's and dealing with that. And I think that a lot of folks, especially at work, you can feel like, okay, so I've, I've shared the news, but now I, I the pregnancy didn't 
result in a live birth. And that's sort of a, a collective, you know, they're, these people know, they know it didn't end up happening. Yeah. What should we do here? Same thing when it comes to any death in our family or an injury, or maybe we discover that someone's in recovery due to an addiction. Um, there are a lot of ways that we can experience hard times uh, that, that can make us want to reach out and at the same time feel like if we're a work colleague, we're not close enough to reach out to the person and touch right. upon this very personal moment in their lives. And what we really discovered through our qualitative research doing the book was that reaching out makes such a difference, that it is so important to reach out during hard times. How you reach out also makes a big difference. So you mentioned the what to say, what not to say section. Yeah. One of my favorite sections in the book, no joke, y'all. I just texted that to one of my best friends last night. Her colleague found out it, actually exactly what we were just talking about. Pregnancy didn't make it. Mm -hmm. And um, it was like three days to the due date. I mean, this was really, oh, tra wow. really wow. tragic. And she said, you know, it's not his child. He was the uncle, but he is clearly grieving. Do I send him a note? What do I say? What can I offer to do? And so I sent her screenshots of the book. I was like, I know your book's Great. on the way. So here you go. But think about things like, you don't want to put a lot of burden on the person who's experiencing hardship. So mm -hmm. rather than say, let me know what I can do for you. Yeah. That, that means they've got to think of something and then feel comfortable asking you for it. Instead, you might say something like, hey, I know our workloads are really crazy right now. If you mm -hmm. want me to take five or six of those you know, briefs off your desk, I would be more than happy to do that for you. Just you know, let me know anytime. I'd be happy to do that. Or if it's a death in the family, you might say something like, um, I would be happy, and, and this is, of course, only if you feel comfortable offering this, but right. I'd be happy to help with the kids and picking them up after soccer practice or something like that. Give an actual thing that the person can say yes or no to. Another thing is people say, oh, g give me a call anytime. I'm here to help if you need an ear. Right. So generous and lovely, but it puts the onus on the other person to be reaching out. Instead, right. say, I'm going to check in with you Thursday and see how you're doing. And then make an appointment in your book so that you remember to call the person on Thursday and check in with them. They might choose to ignore your phone call. That's fine. Right. But at least you're taking the pressure off of them. You're taking care of the work during this time. Okay, we're going to spin it into some fun. Okay, good, good, good. <laughs> the last round. So let's talk a little bit about dating because okay. I'm sure you cover that in your book. So maybe there's some things that you might want to talk about why it entice people to purchase the book. Um, tell us, this is really tricky. I don't even know how to say it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, it's just so hard now, whether, you know, like, should the man pay? Should the woman pay? Yeah. If the man pays, how many times should she pays? And, you know, I don't, but, you know, what are some of the things you talk about in the book, maybe that can help people kind of figure that out? So we sort of folded dating into a lot of other places in the book. And one yeah. of the places it really comes up is when we talk about chivalry. Yes. And a lot of people think chivalry is dead, but a lot of people also don't like chivalrous acts. They don't want right. a chair held for them. They don't want a coat held for them. Um, they want that first date to be uh, equal partners coming together and they want right. to pay for themselves. So we tend to fold it into things like um, whoever does the inviting does the paying. So you okay. really want to be clear with your invitation. I would love to treat you to dinner Friday night, or I would, you know, maybe it's not right. even an issue of treating, but I would love to to pick you up and, and have us go for a hike on Saturday afternoon. Right. Um, this makes it really clear what's going on, what the intention is, everything. It's easy for someone to respond. And Let's say that you don't want to be treated. You could then respond with, oh, you know, Friday dinner Friday night sounds wonderful. But if it's all right with you, I'd really love to, to pay my own way. Or some people use phrases like Dutch treat. There are a lot yeah. of different, different words you can use. Some people don't like using words that associate with a specific culture yeah. in regards to splitting the bill. So, you know, pick, pick and choose what works for you. Um, but it, we sort of fold it in. One of the places I really loved folding in the advice. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait, sorry before I get ahead of myself, the chivalry stuff. 
ask first. So may I hold your coat for you? Would you like help with your chair? Could I get that door for you? These are ways that you can ask first. And then the other person can say, no, that's all right. I've got it. Or that'd be lovely. Thank you. And it yeah. gives them the choice. You're still being respectful because you're recognizing that there's an act here that could be really well received or that it might not be. And you're asking about it first. My favorite part of the, the dating advice that got folded in, however, is when we're, we were talking about um, declining and yes. handling a decline nicely, that telling someone that they're a jerk just because you didn't want to go on a date with that, they didn't want to go on a date with you is really bad manners. Right, yeah. <laughs> you no, know, you might have all been been chatting each other up at a bar or, or maybe um, at a cafe or something like that, or even at a dog park. And it's right. okay if someone doesn't say yes or doesn't feel comfortable saying yes to your offer of a date. And being able to receive a rejection well is such an important part of dating. Being able to say, oh, okay, totally understand, you know, glad I got the chance to ask. That's as simple as it has to be. You don't have to tell someone they're a jerk because they didn't feel like going on a date with you. <laughs> well, and that, so are they doing it by text, email? What should you do? Because that's a big thing now. <laughs> totally, totally. So honestly, I mean, the, the offer of a date can come in any format and it really depends really? on how you're connected date? to the person. So <laughs> I think a lot of people nowadays text first date requests and things like that. I was so impressed. This was probably like seven years. I've been on the single game for a long time now. And about yeah. seven, seven or eight years ago, I remember this guy who... We had exchanged numbers and we talked about going for a run for a date. I mean, like definitely feeling active. Right. I was a little nervous. He picked up the phone and he was about six years younger than me. So so think he was probably in his young 20s. I was in my late 20s, early 30s at the time. Mm -hmm. And he picked up the phone and called me to actually schedule the date. And it was impressive, wow. y'all. It was impressive. Right. And wow. so I really loved how direct I was. Whereas a yeah. couple of just last year, I was trying to set up a date with someone and the answers I kept getting back via text message when I tried mm -hmm. to call him were things like, um, probably Wednesday would work or yeah, yeah. that might be where, and my East coast self could not handle right. this. I was like, man, you got to give me like, yes, no's pick a date. Let's set it, put it in the calendar. Either we right. do or we don't. It's fine either way. <laughs> that is so true. That's right. So how do you, and how do you and Daniel actually come up to do this book? Like it's just so much information. Like how do you vet it? Like how do you, how do you even start? Because there's it's so, so much. hard. I, I gotta say, and this was our first time rewriting it from scratch ever. We've never done that before. Um, oh, wow. That's basically amazing. we said, let's, you know, very um, sound of music. Like I'm hearing that song in my head. Let's start at the very beginning. It's a yeah. very good place yeah. to start. <laughs> so we explained um, at the very start of the book, what Emily posted etiquette is about because there's tons of different kinds of etiquette out there. There are etiquette right. experts who are very rules-based. There are people who have more British styles of etiquette. Mm -hmm. um, there are people who have more casual etiquette than we do. So we really try to lay out what Emily Post etiquette is. And at Emily Post, we base our etiquette on consideration, respect, and honesty. And then we tend to think of ourselves as a social barometer. We use that podcast audience. We use all of the wonderful emails we get from folks. Hopefully we'll be using our Substack discussions and polls in the future. Yeah, yeah I'm on um, the list. I saw that. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <But take, laughs> we're so excited about that space. <laughs> but we really use those things to take kind of a, a finger on the pulse of American culture. We think of ourselves like a social barometer, not mm -hmm. a dictator. We don't just make right. up rules to make them up. Um, we really try to have them either be based in a tradition that's been familiar with folks, or right. if it's something new, that we're really leaning on that consideration, respect, and honesty to guide our answer. You know, how how do you figure out when it's time to include another title in the types of titles that you talk about? Well, right. there are a lot of people out there using the title mix, talking about the title mix, 
it felt like a really good time to make sure that we really fleshed out mix. It was in our 19th edition. We did a better job of it in this edition. So it's a lot of it is um, taking the time to think and taking mm -hmm. the time to listen and then sort of taking all the feedback that you get and funneling it through those three principles, consideration, respect, and honesty. And that's really great. And how do you keep yourself motivated? Because this is a lot. Because when people say, like when I said, I was like, Emily Post, <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, how do you do You know, because you're upholding a legacy. Yeah. And that's just, you know, I can only imagine that's a lot, you know. It's a, it is a lot of pressure. There are, we've learned to take the heat. I've developed a thicker skin. There's always going to be someone who tells you, no, the spoon goes above the fork or it goes below the fork when you're setting yeah. it for dessert. Um, there's always going to be folks who say, no, this is how you do it. And you just kind right. of have to say, you know, we were entrusted with this tradition and we've been working at this company for 15 years. Uh, we really feel confident about the direction that we're taking it in. And we are one option. And I know it seems silly to be out here promoting our book and everything and say, yeah, there's other people you can follow if you want to, but it's true. There are people who are huge fans of Miss Manners, Letitia Baldridge, and she right. does a fabulous job writing more humorous styles of etiquette. But her etiquette is, is sometimes different from ours, right. and that's okay. So find what works for you. Figure out what resonates with you. What we really care about is that you're thinking about how your actions are going to impact the people around you. And even mm -hmm. if you're just doing that, you are so much further ahead of the game. You are you are participating in etiquette in such a good way that I think starting from that baseline and then moving through all the details is is really a great way for us to be representing etiquette in America. This is amazing. Now, besides <laughs> etiquette, what else do you do, Lizzie? Something that you can oh share God. with everyone. <laughs> like my real life outside of it, basically like I live and breathe my work. Um, right. But I am, I, I have a wonderful dog. I don't know if you can see him. He's stretched out on the couch behind me. Right. Um, and so I love going running with him. That's that's something I really enjoy. Dog walks with girlfriends is, is something I really enjoy. Um, I am a golf nut. I absolutely love golf. Um, I'm a big fan of football too. I'm a New Orleans Saints fan. Who dat to who dat nation out there. Um, so th those are some of the things I like. Vermont is a really beautiful place. Um, just getting out in nature in Vermont is something I love. I've become an avid gardener. Um, nice. So, these are, you know, just some of the things I try to do when, when I'm not writing books. <laughs> right. And it, you know, it's so interesting too, when you and Daniel, um, how did you kind of merge your perspectives? Because I'm sure he had some ideas, you had some ideas, and you're like, but well, this is both our great great grandmother. And we're oh, gonna do yeah. this. <laughs> I, I think some of my favorites are the knockdown drag out fights we get into over how to hold and use your utensils. <laughs> no right. joke. There was one day in the office before my parents retired um, when my my dad and I eat in a similar way and my mother and Dan eat in a similar way. And the four of us were just standing around calling each other all ridiculous for how we eat. <laughs> that is funny. And so it can get very silly. At the end of the day, um, we recognize that the you know, it, it doesn't really matter. What matters is that we collectively come together with advice that's going to be clear and consistent for our audience. So there are some, some battles you win, some battles you lose, but at the end of the day, you're all trying to come from a point of making people feel comfortable and at ease right. around each other. So it's like the, the battles just end up being ridiculous. Like you, like I'm laughing about it now because it is so funny to think about. <laughs> You know what? Before we close out, a couple of things. Talk about the Substack again. The Substack. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, so people can know about that. We've had a newsletter for a good fifteen years now, and it it gets delivered right to your inbox. Substack. If you've already signed up for our newsletter, um, yeah. you'll still just get it straight to our inbox. Inbox straight to your inbox. Excuse <laughs> me. Um, but what's really great about Substack is that it. It provides more than a newsletter for us on the, the production end. We're able to attach comment sections uh, to uh, the, the weekly emails that we send out so that we can get feedback from our listeners. Uh, we're able to sort of merge our podcast 
um, and our newsletter together in this medium, which okay. we're really excited about, and add that community component of discussion threads and polls to sort of take the temperature of the audience. So what I love about it is that um, you're, we actually are going to engage with you more than we have been <laughs> before yeah. we would do like a really miles long, you know, like email that was a newsletter every other month. Now we'll be delivering our podcast and any Emily Post news on Mondays. On Thursdays, you're going to get a deep dive article. So I think our very first one is coming out on Thanksgiving. And it's all about, it's all of our Thanksgiving, uh, or sorry, all of our table setting diagrams. So that whether you're throwing a casual meal or a very formalized meal, you can access those on the holiday morning and really set your table beautifully. On Saturdays, we do something called the Saturday Sip. And I really love this. Oh, because, I like that idea. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that <laughs> I, like, I was like, oh. That little cup icon. Yeah. Um, the Saturday Sip is an etiquette tip, a recipe from the 1950 Emily Post etiquette book, and a quote from Emily. So it's kind of like a quick, easy, gentle way to, to kind of inspire you throughout your weekend from Emily Post. Um, and I'm really excited about all this. This is also a place where we're really hoping to be able to do things like distribute Emily's books that she wrote before etiquette that are, um, there's one that's a cross country adventure that she and her son and her cousin took. Um, uh, they, they were some of the first people to drive across America when there aren't, weren't roads. They, they were following the Lincoln Highway to start with, but it's called By Motor to the Golden Gate. Um, we're hoping, she's got these fictional works that were basically um, like romance novels from the 1920s oh, and 19-teens. And so we thought these would be really fun ways to uh, really bolster, especially the paid subscription side of Substack and be able to connect with our audience, folks who are really curious about Emily, um, yeah. we'll get more of her. So we're really excited about this space. The best part about it though, Danella, is that it just comes straight to your inbox. You don't have to click a link. You don't have yeah. to do it. Thing is just sign up for it. You'll start getting really great content on a weekly basis. And thank you for letting me share about it. We're really yeah, no, don't. And I'm already signed up. I was like, oh, this is great. I did like the Saturday sip. I have to tell you, I was like, oh, that's such a good idea. <laughs> I'm so glad. Feel free to use it. <laughs> yeah. So I always ask people. Now this is probably going to be a funny question because you're an author. So okay. you have to say what is your favorite book that you're reading now or you've read something that influenced you that oh you my gosh I, oh, <laughs> I'm so terrible I'm like I have that um that fantasy lit like you know the twilights and the Sookie Stackhouse series oh <laughs> my Harry gosh Harry Potter, I, I you know <laughs> it's like I I I really really love the Harry Potter books and I kind of never got over them um mm -hmm. recently I've been working my way through um the Obama memoir and so oh, okay. that I've been listening to that on audio there's also this fabulous series by a gentleman named Alan Bradley they're called the Flavia de Luce novels and they're mm -hmm. just about this little British girl in like 1930s, 40s England, who's just a little chemistry genius and she's solving murders. I mean, this sounds ridiculous when I say it out loud, but they are some of the most entertaining books I've ever read. Um, she solves murders in her little town and it's, it's she's very precocious in all the right ways, very delightful character. Um, I love Jane Entwistle who reads those books on Audible. I'm a huge Audible consumer. Okay. I really, really love it. So anyway, those are those are some of my geek outs, but I'm that person who will often reread a book like 20 times over rather than picking a new book. <laughs> oh, wow. They say you should do that. That's how you learn it. Brian really? Holiday. Okay. So it's Brian not Holiday. bad. Okay. okay. Brian Holiday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to close out. We want to thank you so much. But before we do, I always ask someone um, to close out my special guest to close out with something of inspiration that you want to share with oh. everyone. I think probably the Emily Post quote that I I just we've always loved is that um uh oh my gosh and now of course I'm going to blank on it um that uh Emily talks about how etiquette is really about how people's like whenever this is it quote <laughs> whenever <laughs> two people come together and their behavior affects one another you have mm -hmm. etiquette it is not some rigid code of rules. It's simply how person's lives touch one another. And to me, that is such a guiding North Star in our business at Emily Post and in my personal life that it's 
it's not about all the details. It's really about how we're treating each other, whether I'm holding a door for you or whether uh, someone is planning a wedding in the merger of two families or maybe two businesses. Right. Etiquette is going to be a part of it. So what can you do to bring your best self to that relationship and build that relationship, even if you never see the person again? Wow. Thank you. That was wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> okay. well, thank you. And, you know, and again, on LinkedIn, we're going to connect. Yes. Shame on you. You were not connected on LinkedIn. And I was, I was I always I'm, check. I'm so <laughs> terrible with social media. <laughs> so you have to do it. Encouragement. Because I would love to connect you too with our next guest who I'm going to have. And I hope you can join. I'm going to have Senator uh, Andrew Z Zwicker. Oh, wow. Yeah, so we have de definitely a lot of guests and there's some people I want to connect you with as well. Um, thanks to everyone out here who was who were watching Raritan Neighbors. This was just really, Lizzie, it's amazing. I almost said Emily again. <laughs> it's okay. It happens all the time and I really don't mind. <laughs> Frankly, it's flattering. That's how you know we're live, everyone. I almost called her her great-grandmother, Emily Pose. <laughs> <laughs> totally fine. <laughs> Lizzie, thank you. And I want to give a shout out to, I got to give a shout out to your cousin, Daniel. Please. We are thinking about you. <laughs> He's awesome. He's really, really, I mean, a dude in etiquette. He's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Which is great. So thank you so much. We hope to have you again. I'm going to connect you up too as well. Thank you so much for taking your time to do this. Thank Happy you. I really, really appreciate it. And I hope you and everybody watching has a fabulous Thanksgiving. Definitely send in your table setting photos to Emily Post. We would Ooh, love yes. to see them on our Instagram and Facebook. <laughs> oh, that's very cool. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Have a happy holiday. Happy holidays.